conversation with my neighbor. He's an OBGYN. Uh, he lives above me. He's so cool. they're the they're the people in the the spot above, and they had a little party on Sunday night. He threw it for like all his nurses, all the nurses in like the uh, labor and delivery and obstetrics and gyne gynecology and all of that. And we were talking. He's from New Jersey, and so he he was here for like 10, 12 years, then went back with his wife who's Filipina and they went back to New Jersey were there for a couple of years. And he was like, man, I, I just, I, I couldn't, he was like, I, it's, it's, he's like, it's a wrap. I had been changed. I had been changed too much. He's like, so I'm not, he's, he came back and he's like, I'm never leaving. This wow. is it, you know? Wow. And now, now, especially cause where would I go back to? Like, I'd likely go back to California where my family is, you know, or, you know, California Kansas city a hot mess. You know, there's California's a mess. Yeah. There's Kansas City, you know, just throwing that out there. There's a pretty good parish there. I mean, that would be the that would potentially be the <laughs> other option. Hey, what else I'm, would talking you about, do? I'm talking about St. George's, by the way. But it's <laughs> like... Okay, so hello and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And tonight I'm going to ask Cyprian and Father Turbo, do you guys have any like uh, guilty pleasures on YouTube? Like when you guys are cruising YouTube and there's like, like maybe something you're like, eh, I don't know if I, nah, but I will, you know, like one of those I things. I mean, I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a street beefs. Uh oh, okay. Yeah, I like beefs. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I like these with street beefs, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I uh man. I yes. And it's like, man, it's and and it's one that I think I've had for a long time because I was always um like totally like natural in terms of the bodybuilding. And I think as I get older, I'm like, ah, kind of but these guys who will get there's there's this whole community of guys who are who are calling out bodybuilders who say that they're natural and they're just totally like steroided up and it's it's a hilarious like, like the liver king yes these are the yeah. guys who like called out liver king. but there's but it's a whole like genre of guys and these guys are so funny they're tongue in cheek. They're so funny, and it's just and the people are ridiculous. Yeah. So it's just like you know, it's one of one of those like that's a real guilty pleasure, right? That it's just like laughing at these people, even though I know because I look and I'm like, oh man, this is going to be so terrible for you in like 20 years. Your body's going to be yeah. a wreck. You know, you're looking at somebody destroying themselves, but at the same time, they're so they're so just full of themselves and puffed up and narcissistic, and then these guys are just ripping them down. So yeah, it's unfortunate, but I admit it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what fair. about you, man? Um, I would say like I've really had to change my YouTube habits because there's definitely some some stuff that calls to like the bad parts of me. Like not even like maybe anything like terribly scandalous, but for a while, like I like I would have said my guilty pleasure was like definitely getting like seeing owned videos, you know, like. Mm -hmm. sjw owned or whatever mm -hmm. i'm really not into that anymore um i think probably the one that i would be the most like yeah if somebody saw that in my history I'd be like yeah it's like i still get really into like video game glitches like i don't play video oh. games anymore but i think like a good like compilation of like characters just like completely blood like bugging out and flying across the map and stuff like that still gets me pretty hard and there's like Especially like those Bethesda games like Skyrim and Oblivion. There's a whole bunch of like really funny glitches of like a guard just like those. lying on the ground talking to you like it's completely normal. And then their body just flies off the screen for no <laughs> like, like some massive coding error or something. I've seen those. <laughs> and I I think like those still like 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 I can snort laughing. Like so mm -hmm. um 
but actually it's pretty I've interesting. lost in that rabbit hole before for sure. it's mm-hmm. it's de- and like i don't play video games and i don't even try to vicarious to like play them through other people like i'm not one of those guys either like i don't like watching just sitting down watching someone play mm-hmm. that's a whole trend i don't get the whole twitch streaming i just don't mm-hmm. get it but um i still th- i'll still keep my toe in and like it's pretty cool to watch like world war one like first person shooter games like i like watching people play those like i think that's actually pretty fun but the reason i bring that up is because uh i had this moment where i was watching like uh clips of idiocracy on youtube whoa it's crazy that you would bring that up i, know, I was right? just talking about that yeah half right before this i was talking with the buddy about idiocracy it's in the whoa. air because i've known a couple people who have been whoa. into idiocracy again haven't watched it for like a decade and a half and then they're watching it again Dude, right now. i was watching i was because he had said because i pointed out the brondo thing and he's like i don't know and then he texted me and he's like oh i don't know if i've ever seen this movie german guy so literally as i was after i was set yeah. up i was sitting here and i was re-watching the brondo scene yeah <laughs> it's it's pretty good a, like it's a few minutes it's, it's the last thing in my youtube history by the way I, the last thing i was watching is the brondo scene. did you know from what i understand that movie was pretty big and getting crocs to be a thing oh yeah i heard about that yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so like uh mike judge was like we need a a stupid looking shoe or whatever and i'm not Mm -hmm. particularly anti-croc i'm i'm not talking smack on crocs crocs are fine whatever but there's a part where do you remember ow my balls like right yeah uh someone i was watching that part where the dude was watching out my balls or whatever and somebody wrote like this is basically a dank meme collection like on youtube when it's mm-hmm. like the dank memes or whatever mm-hmm. it's just like an eight minute video of just like memes and i was like wow like it's amazing how subtly this stuff has slipped in like because well, it, it's, it, prof- it's prophetic it yeah, is it has totally to be prophetic yeah totally yeah. prophetic yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's but anyway i was like i wonder what probably my guiltiest youtube like pleasure would be like probably something i'm not like super cool about if somebody saw like in my history or in my algorithm or whatever, I'd be like, yeah, that's still kind of a thing. But I don't know if we have a subject tonight, but I do have one that I need to ask father that I've been meaning to ask him for a little while. Let's see where it goes. And yeah, let's see where it goes. Cause I think it could easily tie into like, and there's that one question that got sent out that someone asked, that'd be a good one to cover. Did you see that? No, I did Which, not. Uh, I don't know. Well, I, I'm going to ask, no, ask your question, Andrew, and I'll try to find it. So, Father, with the alphabet soup stuff and with the like, what, whatever, whatever crazy thing is going on, when should you like, or should you boycott a business because of something? You know, like if you pull in, because like my wife used to go to this coffee shop and now it's got a, a huge all inclusive whatever flag, whatever hanging in the window and she's like i just can't i don't really feel right about going to this place when that's just like hanging up there is that appropriate is there a point which you should cut a business off and be like i'm not doing this anymore i think you got to listen to your conscience okay that's fair i think you gotta listen to your conscience is there like is there hallmarks is there like anything we should kind of look for because i mean like i know i still shop on amazon but they definitely send people out of state or whatever to get their surgeries and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, thank you so much. I mean, I think the biggest thing uh, to really be looking out for again is your conscience, but how your conscience can go either way. So this is kind of an interesting little side note. Um, don't assume that you should always listen to your conscience. And what I mean by that is this. Um, A lot of people think that their conscience is always good and fully formed. And, you know, just to be frank, you know, in a general sense, if you are just like coming into the church, a catechumen, only been in the church a couple of years, ah, your conscience isn't formed yet. You know what I mean? Um, we, your, your conscience, that voice, you know, it's fallen and it's, it's a lot of it is 
contingent upon formation. It's all contingent upon formation. So we have this misnomer that it's innately good. Um, and it's just not, <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. It's not, um, a conscience has to be formed and that's why the battle for children, people need to take it serious because, um, it's up, it's, it's the duty. It's the, it's the calling of parents to help form the, the conscience of a child, Right. And the church forms the conscience of an individual. So it isn't this kind of like, I got a perfect connection to God. And if I just listen to this inner voice, it's going to always ste steer me the right way. Uh, no, it's not. Because your conscience, a lot of, a lot of people's conscience is actually just um, moralism. And it's, sure. it's, not, it's not God, you know? Yeah. So that's my caveat to listen to your conscience. So put those two things together. Um, okay. Get your conscience formed. How do you form your conscience? You form your conscience through the, the life of the church, okay. right? Just, yeah, suffering's a big part of it, but let, let's, let's just also be clear about something. Um, suffering in of itself is not redemptive. Suffering in of itself has the potential to be redemptive, but it's not an automatic thing, right? Yeah. The context matters. The context, the context matters. matters, right? So the life in the church, and, and, and again, I'm just going to unpack this because, and, and this, is, this is interesting. I had a situation recently with someone, and it, I guess it's good. It just reaffirmed, for me at least, that we should continue doing our project at least for a little bit longer because... I had an in-person conversation with a young man, great young man, and you know he's been drawn to the church and everything, but like he's coming to the church for political philosophical reasons, and he wasn't even sure if Christ is like that he was definitely you know have he, the Christ he's encountered is the Christ of Jordan Peterson, you know sure. what I mean so that's still a thing right yeah. that's that's still a thing um and and I'm all for it, you know like let's clean the fish. You know what I mean? I don't want to throw any fish back. Right. We already talked about this, but I just think it's important to understand, like, you know, that's great that um, you have some compass, but the, you got to get your conscience formed. You get your conscience formed um, by submitting to the church. And that doesn't just mean like kind of memorizing the rule book. You know what I mean? It's, it's the process of repentance. It's the process of obedience to to the church, which is an incarnate reality. It's mm. not disincarnate. You know what I mean? It has to be embodied. Um, and then and only then can you begin to, to really kind of trust your conscience on those things. So, you know, I, hopefully that flushes it out without it being too. No, get the little guy cleaned up first, make sure his orientation is correct and then start, start, start working with him. Like if he's, if he's like, Hey, you know, whatever, like whatever spouting, whatever moralism, and that little guy being your conscience, your little Jiminy cricket mm -hmm. and like in your ear or whatever. So, well, this has been coming up. It's this, this has come up recently in a number of conversations that I can recall that were notable to me. And as a question that people have asked me, and so maybe this is a good, cause it's related. Like maybe this is a good time to, to expand on this father uh, and, and, for, for you to help me also, because it's come up often enough, but people who have said that, who have told me they're moving toward Christ, they are looking at their past life and past relationships. And I think they're coming to me because they're trying to understand, like, given my past life, how I've handled the situation of like, because they're asking, well, these people that I used to associate with, mm -hmm. How do I do I need to drop them? And I think, Andrew, there's a lot of things, you know, they're coming from like a mindset of like, is it like recovery where like if I had drinking buddies, I need to stop hanging out with my drinking buddies and all of this. But then they're sure. like at the same time. And this is sort of what I've spoken to them about is, you know, I've had the experience that people in my life who I think I would have thought at a purely like secular psychological level, oh, I need to cut them off. 
What's mm-hmm. weird is those people through my conversion like started reaching out to me and then they started to move toward Christ because they saw what was going on with me. And if I would have cut them off, I would have cut off the opportunity for that. Mm-hmm. And so like this idea of like to burn a bridge or not to burn a bridge. And then if the bridge is not burned, how do I deal with that bridge being open and of it being a connection to the old man? Yeah. Um this is interesting because, well, first of all, there's always exceptions, right? And so I'm loath to submit this to answer something and have it just seem as it's this dogmatic, rigid thing because it's, it's not the case, right? But um, let me just throw out a couple of things. And if I start getting too far off, just reel me back in, right? But like, when when St. Paul, when Saul had his conversion and became Paul, you know, there's this little little blip in the scriptures. I mean, he disappears like seven years. Yeah. Right. And I will just share with you from personal experience. Um, when I had my in my inverted, because my my road to Damascus experience, I've always said is like an inverted one, because it was an encounter with evil, not not with directly with Christ, um, I was led to a, a very similar thing. It wasn't seven years and it wasn't Saudi Arabia, but I definitely just completely disappeared and I, and I had to. And over the years, um, I've seen a lot of conversions over the years, a lot of conversions. And I, I don't say this in an absolute sense, but people who have had that kind of Saudi Arabia moment when they've been able to just like go away for a period of time, even if it's for a few months, you know, they tend to do better. Sure. They, they, they tend, they tend to do better because that's a a pretty common, that's a pretty common thing in the lives of the saints. They have their experience, they go away, then they come back. Yeah. It's, because you can't plant something and then have it barely get root. I mean, the master talks about this, about a plant getting, you know, shallow root and then the sun comes up and then it withers away, right? Someone, you know, generally speaking, needs time to take root. And I just find that that, that tends to be the case. Now, that being said, you know, I mean, it it all depends, but I think the difference is, is, um, is the bridge there using that analogy, burning the bridge is the bridge there. Is is it burned to keep you from falling back in or is it, or do you burn it out of insecurity? Cause there's a difference, right? There's a difference. Like I've, I I almost said I've never, but I can't say that because just I was just talking with Papati about this like three nights ago. I have maybe a couple, maybe a couple people where they might say that I burned the bridge on them, and they might be. I'm not going to say argue with them, right? I, I could, and I would I would own that. I'd say, well, I kind of felt like I had to, you know what I mean? But it really. For me, it was always that, though. It was never trying to cut someone off, but rather almost like self-preservation, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that's, I think that's the difference. Because some people, um, and I have to, you know, I have to own that, too. You know, there's, we're, we're all human beings, and our pride and ego, that's a thing. And sometimes it can be embarrassing to be reminded of where you're at. You know what I mean? The shame that's exactly. there. Exactly. Yeah. So that mm-hmm. that's a real thing. And I know in my life, I can't say for anyone else, but in my life, you know, um I I I personally am sorry and um I wish and I'm trying to live a life of repentance of that, in which I've allowed ego, pride, vanity to motivate me to to be ashamed of someone right and it's happened 
and that's that's why I can kind of talk about it because it's my, I've known the experience of it. But the reality is, is that you know there's there's a need to be discerning in this area because although that may be the case of you know like oh it's kind of embarrassing I don't want anybody to know about that whatever there is a very real danger um in being let's say tempted from behind there's a very real danger in um it's like excluding, allowing what's that excluding someone's possible salvation due to your embarrassment or something like that like well kind of no I, I mean i mean you leaving an aspect of yourself unfortified by by um oh yeah oh, oh okay. Yeah. okay yeah yeah because and i don't pulled, pulled back by nostalgia or something yep, like exactly that. Uh, yearning exactly. for what used to be which is just a imagined fantasy because it was much exactly. worse than, than exactly because yeah. in my mind just as someone who is trying to work out you know i'm, I'm fighting for my own salvation now you know, being a spiritual father and, you know, a father just in general, and now being charged with participating and, and having a measure of responsibility for other people's salvation. Um, I'm more worried about who's in front of me. Like, I'll never really say to someone, oh, you know, well, what about this friend or that person? Because that's really not our theology anyways. Excuse me. That's not really our, our spirituality. You know what I mean? Our spirituality, you know, our our, our disposition, it, it really is best encapsulated in this context of Seraphim Sarab, like acquire the spirit of peace yourself. Because, you know, it's one of the key super dangerous delusions of, of evangelicalism is this idea that you got the thing that can save someone. That's why I don't really worry about like, well, if I do this, someone's going to be lost. I go like that. 99.9% .9 of the time, that's a trap. You know what I mean? Interesting. Okay, because I definitely fall into that as well. Where I'm yeah, like, no, 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 no. I'm because, really worried about... Well, it's not really up to us to, dis to decide exactly. to get saved. It's a trap. Like, it's a it's trap. Not, because... we, can't, we have no choice in that. God's <laughs> God... <laughs> I've, God doesn't need us. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and the thing is, is, that's not just like talking tough. That's not one of those like you know, kind of like, oh, tough Orthodox things to say, like, no, really, like, God doesn't need us. So may I ask then, I, I believe you, I'm not trying to challenge you. Mm -hmm. What about becoming like, what's the difference between that and becoming a stumbling block towards someone? Like, okay. Okay. So the difference is, the one is, um, you are potentially deluded enough to think that you're sufficient in of yourself to make a difference in someone's life and that you are the only instrument that God could use to save someone. Therefore, like I have to do this X, Y, and Z. I have to keep this relationship or whatever. Right. Versus the other one is um, <laughs> there's this, we've, I, we've talked about it briefly like five years ago, whatever, but there's this, you know, wonderful, um, um, principle, Serbian, choiceful. Mm. If you remember, we, we talked about it once, mm -hmm. you know, and like choiceful is like the, from my perspective, it's one of the, and one, another great point for why the Serbian spirituality is like the best. It's like, to me, it is, there, there's a couple of core things that, I, you know, um, besides history, besides so much, I mean, everything about the church is obvious, right? But there's certain things about just looking at spirituality and the practice of spirituality um, that I just win, win me over for orthodoxy. And I just think that it's like they're always these trump cards, right? Because no one else has these concepts, really, um, these principles. First one, obviously, is prelist. Like, prelist Spirit. is wow. Right. Spiritual deception being deceived yep. by spirit. Yeah. But the other one's choice foe. And and choice foe, uh, for those who didn't see when we talked about it or, or or just a reminder, is um preserving others from yourself. Right? Like like that to me, 
that's orthodoxy. Like yeah. that sums up our spirituality and, and our theology in such a powerful way, you know, um, protecting others from yourself. Choiceful, like, wow. Isn't, isn't that kind of a little bit like the demoniac with the chains, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's, that's perfect because a lot of people, um, I mean, you can read it, you know, and it's not like a, a bad reading, but I think people miss out on that. And it's, as you know, it's like every time it comes up, that's like part of the homily I give, but the, the chains of the demoniac are a sign of love. Oh. Right? Because, because those chains were there to keep the demoniac from hurting others. And so, you know, like, like again, most people never heard it because they're not in the parish, but I'll just say it for, for the sake here. But, you know, those boundaries that we have to erect um, to preserve, like, relationship and to preserve the life of others when we know we're in danger. Like, you know, if if you are an addict of whatever kind, your passions are out of control, your envy, your lust, whatever these things, you know, you need to have these chains to bind you because th- those chains in this sense are there to preserve others from, from harm from you, from you. Sure. Right. Cause the demoniac was, was bound with these chains because he was a danger to his community and to himself and to himself. Right. So we, it's, it's a whole nother way of looking at that. And we, um, you know, another analogy I like to use is like, you know, the wolf man, you know, like Mm -hmm. really understanding what, what that means and how we should really interpret the mythology of the wolf man, because um, the person who is passionate and even, you know, members of our community who are afflicted, you know, certain times of <laughs> certain times of, of the month, you know, it's of like the month. Yeah. Like in yeah, a cycle, with the moon, yeah. you know, it's like, that's a, that's a real thing uh, for some people. And so uh, I think it's hard for people to hear this. And the fact that it's hard for people to hear this is just one of the many examples and um, proofs that, you know, we as a society, uh, we as a culture have a real hard road ahead of us. We have these real difficulties in becoming truly orthodox, not just taking on the affect. Because sure. it's easy to kind of take on the affect of, you know, uh, the traditions of the church, the aesthetics of the church. Because in, in many ways, people, we can end up, you know, just whatever Baptist, Calvinist, you know, evangelical, whatever you were in, in cassocks and in, in icons. Sure. But, but to actually internalize these things and to practice them to get to the heart, you know, I, I mean, I would just say that's probably, that's probably the one sermon I have that's just packaged a million different times. It's just, we got to get to the heart. We got to get to the place where, it, it, you were actually internalized and have these things, you know, through internalizing them change our hearts. Because if we don't, I think there's a lot of people who, you know, unfortunately on that day, many would say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Do we not cast out demons in your name? And their heart, you know, when the Lord says, you know, away from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. That's because their hearts weren't changed. Sure. They were religious. They were, you know, quote unquote orthodox. They they were good moral people, right? They had right behaviors, but their hearts were not changed. And the heart needs to change because this is where we enter into sharing the life of the Theotokos. We need to we need to, you know, embody Christ. We need to have him inside of us. In the same way that she bore him and brought him, you know, gestation, brought him to life. We needed to do the same thing in our lives. Yeah. And, and, but instead of a womb, it's, it's, it's the throne room of our heart versus a womb. And that throne room, if it's not actually changed, this is, this is the, the, the um, solution to that riddle of like, well, how is it that people are going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy your name? 
And it's too easy to just say like, oh, well, that's just the Protestants that weren't in the church. No. Uh, it's, I've met it's, a couple. I've met a couple of people. It's just like outwardly everything seems chill. And then when stuff goes down, including me back in the day, and still to a degree, it's like when stuff goes down, instantly start complaining, instantly start like, well, you know, if this if this person didn't do this, then this wouldn't have happened and stuff like that. Instead of like a little bit of healthy self-condemnation, maybe I brought this on myself a little bit. Like in this person, like partakes in the church regularly. That's the way that it manifests for me anyway, where when I see it, where I'm like, when like it's like my old priest that my baptizing priest said that we need to be like bread the air bubbles need to be kneaded out so that you know like um when the sacrifice is given you know like there's no holes in the bread there's no air bubbles so that we don't fall over and like for me back in the day anyway it used to be like i would fall over every time just like and yeah that's the way this is this is the like it's it's it, you bringing up the 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 womb father made me think I, like I told you guys that there was a, a party here on my pool deck for a neighbor of mine had a party for like all the nurses and he's an OBGYN. And so there were two midwives there who I ended up sitting down and talking with. And I don't know how it came. What one was kind of like a secular Jewish woman and the other one was evangelical from, I think, somewhere in somewhere in the south. And um, I don't know how orthodoxy came up or how, how we got into that discussion, but they seem, they were very interested in um, the evangelical woman. She asked, well, could you like attend? She, she was very interested. She was like, Oh, I would love to attend like an Orthodox church with the singing. And she was like, could you attend an evangelical church? And I was like, well, you know, we're, we're not actually supposed to be praying. Like if we went there, wouldn't be supposed to be praying with, and they were very much like, Oh, well, what is like, what's that all about? And why? Like, why would that be? The, the Jewish woman was like, because she didn't know anything about Christianity, really. And she mm-hmm. was like, why? But it seems like, don't you both believe in Christ? Like what? And it was interesting because I was she was like, well, why? But why orthodoxy? Why orthodoxy? And and just at that moment, I was like, oh, well, you're midwives. Right. And I was like, so you've been trained. There's a, a way that the birth is going to take place, because what I told them is, we actually understand that we're participating in the process and that that can go wrong, that that going wrong because mm-hmm. of us can have dire consequences for everybody around. And I was like, mm-hmm. you're midwives. So there's an orthodoxy of how to do midwifery. And there's a tradition that's been passed down. And you know that if you, if you diverge from that tradition at its specific important points, it can actually mean the death of the the mother and the child that you're dealing with. And if there was someone who came in as a midwife, who was like, I love being a midwife. I love being a midwife. But on this particular point that you know, and you've been trained and there's a tradition that says, no, you do it like this, because if you do it in this other way, the woman, there could be dire consequences. And she's advocating that other way. Not only would you not allow her into the room with you when there's deliveries actually taking place, but you would actively tell people who mentioned, oh, I'm going to her as a midwife. You'd be like, yo, seriously, stop. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because in that moment, they got it like they both got it. And I also felt the evangelical woman shook to her core. Yeah. To her core shook because then it was like, oh, it's not abstract. That's actually real. Yeah. Yeah, and and I would say this again from experience, personally, and I've just seen it countless times. At the end of the day, when you get someone in that that similar situation, so many of the things they've turned a blind eye to hit them, and and all the like, ooh, ooh, you know, like just oh, never mind that, or just all kinds of things. They're like, oh my gosh. You know, like they realize that their house is built on sand. They, they realize it. Mm-hmm. And that is what shakes them to the core. Right. Because when it's not a religion, like that's that's also the point at that point where it's like, no, it's not just about which denomination mm-hmm. am I going to be? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because it's not about which denomination of midwife am I going to be? It's mm-hmm. like if you do it that way, the mm-hmm. mother lives. Mm-hmm. If you do it this way, the mother mm-hmm. dies. 
Mm-hmm. It's not a denomination. It's oh, that's man. not how it works. Mm-hmm. No, no. And and again, that's a great analogy. Like Saint Ernest de Leon, he talks about those who are on their way to martyrdom and deny Christ and call them stillborns. You know, yeah. um, and and the reality is is kind of getting back to that. And I, I think this is important. It's it's come up a couple times and. It's worth talking talking about because um, it seems to be, and it's it seems to be a, one of those kind of consistent points that people struggle with, which is like, well, what is the church? You know what I mean? And well, I believe in Christ. I'm the body of Christ, and, and la la la. And it's like, um, you're not in the church, though. You know, and it's and this is really important because there's people who will kind of orbit around the outside because they don't have that notion challenged of orthodoxy is cool. It's, and they look at it as a denomination. It's like, Oh, it's cool. And it's the older flavor of something, whatever. And they don't really have that, notion challenged in a way that will get them to really see the the dire nature of the of the issue you know what i'm saying um because now especially with the shifting sands of belief and practice and like well who is christ and like i have christ and like you know like meaning i being a person who's doing something that most people at one time would have thought so obviously not Christian, but now, I mean, like the, the fact that everything can be up for grabs, that type of uncertainty, I think, is working um, in the lives of a lot of people. But the thing that hangs them up is not so much, I want to be safe. I want to be, you know, out of Sodom. It's not that it really does come down to having them bow their knee to Christ. And I'm talking about people who say they're Christians, right? Christ, Christ as he is. Christ as he is, not as you want him to be. Yeah. Christ, Christ as he is. And and that's where, you know, everyone, not everyone, many people run into this rich young ruler scenario where he, he calls them like, Hey, okay, well, here's the deal. And that's the thing is, you know, we can say, well, we are the church because, there is no other place where, you know, people submit their lives in such tangible incarnational ways to an authority outside of themselves. And we, yeah. we live it out. We manifest it. We, we, we evidence it. It isn't just, you know, kind of abstract ideas. And that's just the beginning point. That's just the beginning point of giving up your Sunday, giving up your Saturday of, you know, making the sign of the cross over your food, you know, in public. That's just like the the basic one-on-one obligations. You start getting to what we're trying to talk about in regards to the heart and things like that. It gets, it gets really tough, you know? So I think that's, I think that's the thing, getting back to the burning of the bridge and, and really kind of understanding what's at stake. And I think that's, that is probably one of the safest ways to really understand, you know, um, acquire the spirit of peace that thousand around you be saved. You know, that that's one of the safest ways to understand why, although yes, we're called to be fishers of men, you know, the way we fish and how we fish and why we fish isn't necessarily what people might think because sure. the reality of, well, am I in the boat? You know what I mean? Like that, that's something that a sober Orthodox Christian before they go fishing, they want to really assess that, you know, am I in the boat, you know? And so is this bridge really there? You know, like, like, like what is the purpose of this bridge? Because, um, okay, great. Maybe if I leave it be, okay, great. I'm not actively trying to keep someone from the life of the church, but maybe if I know myself well enough, I'm like, eh, Nobody's looking. I might cross back over into town and do a little something, something, you know? So that, I think getting back to your original question, that's why we should really 
kind of reconsider some of the um, the bravado that we might have in regards of, you know, the potential for us to to make something happen in somebody's life, you know? Yeah. And I, I mean, this I'm, I, for, for me, when this has come up and it's even come up recently, what I what I've been trying to discern is. Like, is this a cross? Never, never mind. Um, like, not necessarily like converting the person, right? Like, not like proselytizing to the person necessarily. But do I give into a temptation to cut myself off from this person because it's it's easier to just not have the effort of engaging them as Cyprian, mm-hmm. right? Like but they want they want to engage with me or they're expressing that they want to engage with me and it's like well am i not engaging with them because out of expediency there will be a temptation for me to fall back into just even just the orientation mm-hmm. right because it's because it still is like that old man is still there for me you know and it's like I, I and I actually don't necessarily want to behave in that way, but you know it's a pattern of catching up with old friends or whatever it is, the, it's and you amazing. fall back into the person that you were. It's amazing you how know? quickly that happens. Like it, it it's happens so fast, right? To me. Like I hadn't seen my family in a couple of years uh, when I got sober and orthodox and stuff like that. I kind of exiled myself for like a year and a half, something like that. When I came back, it was amazing how quickly I started like acting like a 14 year old like whiny like white kid from the southern midwest i was just like man like this is and i was like remember being so disappointed in myself and just being like man like this stinks i thought i was past this like i thought that this was something i didn't really have to worry about now now i'd be like well yeah duh be humble like remember where you well, are and so am i cutting myself off you know or 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 these folks talking to me as well is it like it's always the question of well am i cutting myself off because i don't want to face the old man right like because i don't want to deal with it and in and in not dealing with it am i am i not refusing to bear a cross that i should be bearing am i in a way almost denying christ and his power in my life like what are you just like trying to avoid a struggle Basically, like, yeah. yeah, is it is it like there's this perpet like potential situation? You're just like, I don't know if I want to deal with this. Like, I just exactly. don't know if I want to deal with this. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I, I think though, if you're asking yourself that, then it's probably better not to. You know what I mean? It's just it's probably why 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 do you why why would that be? Because. Once you've once you've realized that you've hurt someone because of you overestimating yourself and, and the kind of delusion, the bravado that we're, we've been talking about, once you've done that enough times, you go like, I don't ever want to do that again. I, I yeah. see an Isaac the Syrian. He says, I've never regretted my silence. <laughs> and, and once you understand the truth of that, not just abstractly, then it's just it is better safe than sorry, because. You know, um, when you love someone, as you guys know, there's just certain things. It's just like you don't think twice about those things. You don't think twice about running across the table because, like, your wife's choking. You don't think twice about, like, diving over something to grab your kid from falling off the porch. You know what I mean? Um, because because love is the motivator. Um, in this situation there there's a that hesitation it could be just enough to really uh be the sign to spare yourself and that person of a of a potentially really um not just unpleasant but damaging experience you know what and I'm it's saying? A focus on self too i'm realizing it's too that, much yeah it's, it's like, all self I, I would be I, even in the interaction i'd be so focused on myself mm-hmm. and what i was doing that it wouldn't even be a genuine like mm-hmm. what's, the, what's, here, what's the point because here's the other thing to think about and I'm, I'm a big proponent of this you know it's like have a ratio of like eight parts prayer two parts talking 
you know? And it's like, well, if it's really a thing like that, if it, if it really was like, if you're really agonizing on whether I should really engage this person, it's like, well, have you spent the last three nights praying an act at this for them? Have you fasted for them? Have you, you know what I mean? And it's like, no. Wow. So wow. Powerful. It's, yeah, that's powerful. It's all ego. You know what I mean? It's like, if you do that first, if you're like, man, I'm praying, I'm giving up this, I'm, I'm doing that, you know, like, I'm getting counsel, like blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yeah. You know, then you probably should get in there after it, but that's probably not the case. And so since it's not the case, I would just leave it be. And, and, you know, use that as a, use that as an opportunity to see where you're really at. So you can actually kind of reassess and, and calibrate and acquire that spirit of peace yourself. Cause you can't give what you don't got, you know, I, um, shocker when i first found out about orthodoxy i was quite a jerk about it and uh i was very very self-righteous about a bunch of things i'm very comfortable saying that now like yeah i I was completely wrong about that but i have found and uh with god's help like a, a number of people from my life have ended up converting and that was mainly when i just shut up and like just let one person who i care a lot about has had has come very close several times and each time it's because he has said it's how i have seen you change your life it's how i have seen like you're going from where you were because he saw me at some of my darkest to where i'm at now which is a fairly stable trying to walk you know trying to emulate christ the best i can um with some schooling underneath and a good job and stuff like that but that he says is the most powerful like testimony, I guess mm-hmm. that he has more than anything like you would say to him. Before. And that's the problem yeah. is because part of it, the part of the damage done is in that moment is trying to win the argument, mm-hmm. trying to win. And that is what's mm-hmm. the most damaging. And like, I have never walked away. And I know we've said this before, but I've never walked away from a conversation like that, feeling good about myself. And, and like, I'm going I, to. I don't think I should. I think I should be like, I really hope I didn't do too much damage there. Like, I mean, like get a millstone on this guy, like, and throw me into the sea because like of all the damage I've done to the people over the years, because it's like, I'm not going to say countless, but I probably say like two or three solid people in my life that are just like, yeah, I, if this is what this, if this is what Christ has to offer, I don't want it. Like this guy's out of control. And none of those guys really, I don't think really feel that way right now, but that we've definitely made peace since then. But I can say pretty comfortably that like God is like, um, I don't know. Maybe he's like, sometimes like when you get really good minimalist music, when it's just really, it can like do so much more for your brain in like your, your like the, the part of your soul that interacts with music, than like the most complicated like free form jazz do you know what i mean it can like it can engage elegance Elegance is elegance has the has the aspect of simplicity something that something that is complex cannot be elegant and i and i think that a lot of times when i've talked to people cyprian i think that's really what i think i'm trying to get at is is that like ultimately like people want it's very simple it's when they it's like and i'll be quiet after this i know i'm ranting a lot but like I think most of the heresies that people have fallen into through the seven ecumenical councils were because they tried to make something too complicated. Like they tried to make it, they, they really shied away from just like how powerful and un like movable the truth of Christ is. So they're like, well, it can't be like this. He only has to have one nature. There can only be one nature to this, to this God. It can't be a God man. That just doesn't make sense. It's, it's too simple. It's too, but like enormously complicated at the same time, which is what I think I'm trying to say. Cause like sometimes minimalist music can just like one droning note can do like, if it's done well, it's just like, does so much more for me. Well, you know, the thing is it, it, it leaves space and space is where God can inhabit and where, you know what I mean? Where life can inhabit that, that space. It doesn't crowd out life. Um, and there's a paradox that there's maintaining, maintaining the paradox is a big part of 
or, the, or I should say the inability to maintain that paradox is a big part of where you see people getting stumbled and falling into heresies and things like that is because it's um, simplicity. You know, when, when we're faced with simplicity, there's a, there's a divine aspect to like simplicity, you know, and people want to take that simplicity and they want to interpret it as crudeness, as something that's crude. And they want to do that because of, you know, inherently when you encounter the divine, you inherently understand that something is above you. And that's very tough to experience. Um, and so therefore the mind and the ego and, 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 you know, the human person, the heart wants to complicate things or wants to take what is simple and elegant and, and perceive it as crude, you know, and it's tough because it happens in all kinds of areas. You know, I see this all the time. I was just talking about this with someone earlier today where, you know, the reality is, is that our tradition and our, the core of our spirituality is always like, okay, the problem is me. And like, really not just kind of like, oh, okay, that's what I have to think. Like really believing that the problem is me. Um, and once you actually start to practice that and, and experience the truth of it, then you see in your life all the times where you just projected your problems and your issues on someone else because you just couldn't handle the like what someone was simply like the the simple truth that was being presented to you. You know what I'm saying? So it's always like retroactively looking back on it. Your memory's not good. Things become way more complicated, and it's because the fact, the matter of you're failing and, and, and where you were not able to really humble yourself and just allow the truth to come forth in order for you to just, and we see this all the time with the last three years with the um, historic historical revisions over the last three years over data and stuff like that. It's like people can't handle simple, you know, simple truth. So they got to retroactively, you know, complicate things and be like, well, you know, the reality is, is like you were saying this to me the whole time. You were doing this and you were, you were saying I could only do this and that. And it's like, no. Like, yeah, that was maybe half of the time. But what about this other half of the time when this wasn't the case and you just refused to accept it? Right. The simplicity of mental of, gymnastics, the mental, mental gymnastics, gymnastics, the simplicity yeah. of, of just accepting those things people can't do it. And so whether it's an interpersonal situation or whether it's, you know, something of a dogmatic or doctrinal nature, people always, you know, who can't accept the simplicity of truth, who can't leave that space for God to be, they got to complicate it and they got to, you know, rewrite the narrative more complicated to where they're the hero or the victim. You know what I mean? But either way, they're at the center of the story. Sure. And in order for you to get at the center of the story, the story's got to get way more complicated yeah well this this is peterson's interpretation whenever he does scriptural interpretation it's like you know i was thinking about this and it's it's just like this weird winding mm -hmm. crazy thing rather mm -hmm. than just like no god was incarnate mm -hmm. of a virgin mm -hmm. walked on the earth this is what he's mm -hmm. this is what was said when he was yep. on the earth <laughs> died was resurrected like this is yep. it. it's and and it's like that's that's the simple and elegant truth. Now you've taken it and, and it's like, and it's not that it's not wrong because things are fractal. And it's like, well, if it's God, of course, you're going to be able to find similarities into patterns in his creation. Like it's him, but that isn't the, but that isn't the meaning of the very right. simple thing that actually happened. That's right. That's right. Mm. And it's not the meaning interpersonally either. <laughs> you know what I mean? When, when you are interpreting yourself as the victim in a situation, you know, um, and people do that. That's why some people, you know, they end up leaving churches. They end up, you know, they end up leaving parishes. They end up leaving the faith because, you know, um, you know, man, it, it, it's really scary and it's really sad because that's one of the things about prelates, right? It's, it's a fruit of pride and it's um, Abba Dorotheos, 
of Gaza, he, he talks about this man who fell into pride, you know, and, um, you know, he says, like, who's, who's Abba Isaac? Who is he, you know? And, and the Abba Dorothy, he's like, ooh, you better be careful, brother. He comes back, he sees him later. He's like, who's St. Anthony the Great? Who is he? You know, he's like, oh, you better be careful, brother. He comes back, he's like, who's Peter and Paul? You know, like, you know what I mean? Oh, you better be careful, brother. You know what I mean? And finally gets him like, the Holy Trinity, what is that? Who are, you know what I mean? It's like, and, and it, it's, it's kind of a funny story, but if you've known people who have fallen into things like that, which I have, it's like, it's frightening because that's how crazy it can get. And it, it starts with, you know, you just not accepting something because it's too embarrassing or because you're not in control or you're not getting your way. And I'm connecting that back to like burning those bridges because why do you want to keep that bridge there? You know, like really understanding what our motivations are. The only way to do that is to like get into the heart and getting in the heart is it's a thing, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a vacation. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, But that's how, that is the only way, you know, I feel comfortable saying this. That's the only way to be, you know, quote unquote, saved or in Christ is to be in the heart because um, the externals do not and will not cut it. You know, the, the externals are the way in there for sure. Don't get me wrong. The externals are, are speaking of bridges. They are, they are a good bridge to the internal um, of, of, you know, getting, because if you, if you look at externals, you look at behaviors, you look at patterns, you know, patterns of being, and ways of being um, that is the way to really kind of get to the heart, but it's the, it's the way, not the end. Yeah. Right. And, and it's, it's getting in there and allowing the work to be done. That is what makes all the difference in the world. It's an interesting paradox of, you know, the difference between say like self <laughs> that pride would give like a self-centeredness or a self like self idolatry, but that it still does require a self focus to participate in a, to, to be participating, to, to be going in and Mm. going to to say, I, to know I am the problem. There's still like, you can't ignore the self. Mm -hmm. It's a Royal path, I guess you can't Mm -hmm. ignore the self, but you can't exalt the self, Mm -hmm. but you also can't, needlessly tear down the self and ignore it because it's this, but that's this why, one's, but see, that that's, one's hard for that one's hard for me but see that's why it's it's christ because christ every human <laughs> the human being the human person humanity is is Humanity exists, perfect humanity exists. It's Christ, right? And so if if you want to if you want to understand life, if you want to understand what it means to be human, if you just like Christ is life, you know, not just a way of life, not just a type of life, Christ is life. The Holy Trinity, everything that we have and are are echoes and emanations of the trinity sure. so that that kind of conundrum is solved by christ because when we look at christ christ um i don't mean this in the way that it comes off because I, it's kind of sticky theologically how i'm going to phrase this but i think in the context so if anyone wants to like call me out and do that that's fine but i've got the um, bishop on speed dial just so you know. Dial them up, Dabla Dika. <laughs> um, but you know, the the spirit and the father, their spirit. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're, they're, their spirit. And so there's um there's an f- from our perspective, there's an abstractness that's hard for us to engage and to um really, you know, kind of like wrap our minds around to encounter right 
So, you know, the logos, you know, he, he needed to incarnate like that's, you know, and so that's for our sake, right? Because that, because of the uncreated nature of which we are cannot, com- cannot accurately fathom the uncreated reality of God. So the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, the Son, the Logos, is the means by which the ineffable starts to become articulated. The ineffable becomes understandable and approachable for us, right? And that's why, that's why people, a lot of people, they come to orthodoxy and they're into philosophy in a, in a more kind of like a- academic, abstract sense, you know. But eventually, there's the rare few that are actually, you know, gifted and blessed and they need to stay in there. And I do mean the rare few, you know, like they're the rare few that God will have some vocation for them to do, you know, academic theological work. But most people who fashion themselves as, you know, quote unquote philosophers, they encounter orthodoxy, they encounter Christ through orthodoxy. Eventually they really begin to leave off philosophy. Why? Because it really is um, obsolete. There's no uh, philosophy as, as we understand it in this context, right? Um, conjecture, theory, speculation, opinion, you know what I mean? It's well, because obsolete. orthodoxy gives us praxis. Obs- or- orthodoxy gives us praxis, yes, but more importantly, that praxis is the experience of absolute objective truth. Right. That's, that's the thing. And right. that's another reason why, you know, kind of looping back to earlier part of the conversation, it's tough, you know, it, it should never be this, you know, it is never accurately a thing of just saying something of a, a crude barbaric triumphalism or to be mean or cruel, but in a way of like lamenting and mourning and where we should become fishers of men truly, but understanding, you know, why we say like there's one church where, and this is the church and outside is not the church because the experience of Christ is not subjective, abstract. You know what I mean? Like that's kind of, that, that defeats the purpose of Christ. You know what I mean? Of the incarnation, right? Because incarnation leads us out of that unknowing, that darkness of unknowing, right? And it leads us into, you know, a different kind. If, if I could, you know, have some fun right now, it leads us into the darkness of the divine, which is different. Um, and and that that darkness is where we begin to experience, taste, touch, and unite with being or own, you know, like the being. Um, and the darkness is there because the bright, the, because the light is so bright. It isn't a darkness of an absence of light. It's a darkness because our eyes, you know, spiritually speaking, metaphorically speaking, can't handle the brilliance that we are beholding. So to us, it's a darkness, you know what I'm saying? But in that darkness, in that, in that unknowing, not of ignorance, but of humility, we begin to experience truth absolutely, which is a person. And it has to be incarnate because that's what we are. And without that, you know, this this is why this is why the um so much of the gymnastics around like theology and things like that are so dangerous because people end up just spinning their wheels chasing after, you know, these abstract points of, you know, discussion and argument, you know, really not even you're lucky if it comes out to a a zero sum game. A lot of times it's dangerous. Yeah. You're lucky if you just get out neutral. A lot of times, you you know, people get wounded and crippled because, you know, they, they try to grab a hold of something and it's like, uh, it makes it really difficult for them to now grab on a hold when they, when they actually encounter the master. Right, because they've jaded or however you want to look at it. There's a there's parts of their faculty that gets kind of battle damaged. You know what I mean? And it it, it becomes really difficult for them 
to now encounter the simplicity of of, the, of truth, which is right, a person. So I'm putting down the phone because I don't think we need to call the bishop. I think everything you said was okay. Good. So, yeah, you passed the test, but I was I was shaky there for a yeah. second. I was like, all right, all right. no, <laughs> I, that I and like that's the wonderful thing about orthodoxy is like our philosophies do not align. It's our experiences because I've experienced almost everything right. that Father has just said. Father has said, you know, spoke on how we encounter Christ, the darkness, the the trials and the things that we need to go through, our spiritual eyes being blinded. It's all from experience, you know, and I'm not even there yet. But I can tell you that, like, the darkness is real dark. It's when oh. it, it gets there. It's like kind of like trying and if to I can forgive me. Andrew, I just want to say this because this came up recently. I'm I'm really glad you brought this up because I just want to throw this out pastorally, if I could say that, you know. Um, talk a lot about experience, and you know, our faith is empirical in that sense, as Saints are going to talk about. But I just want to throw this out so everyone's clear. When we talk about experience, that experience still has to be vetted. Because there's people who delusion is a real thing. And there's people who they're like, well, this is my experience. And that's how Prelist happens. Yeah. Where you take your experience and it's so um, egocentric that now it trumps everything else, right? So I'll just share with you how I do it, right? I have, a, I have experiences and then I, there's the litmus, right? What has my confessor, spiritual father said? What have the father said about it? What did the scripture say, right? It isn't just like, I'll take one. Because that's what people do. They'll go like, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go read the scriptures and see what they say. Well, that's what Protestants do. And we see the delusion that they're, that they're in. Because right? they can they're... always find one verse somewhere yep. that they can yep. twist in one yep. translation somewhere. That's exactly it. And you see people do that with the fathers too. Someone will take a father or two fathers and go like, see this and this, and then they want to build up a whole thing, but you can't do that. It's the consensus. It's the councils. It's the fathers. It's the scripture. And it's the incarnational reality of your spiritual father or your bishop or, you know, even your community that bears witness, right? Because if you're walking around and you're, you're telling people, Hey, there's a fifth person in the Trinity. I've seen it. It's like, mm. you know what I mean? Hey, 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 you don't, you don't, we don't need to pull out the fourth ecumenical council to talk about that. You know, Johnny, Luke, and Margot are going to be enough to say, you're wacko, buddy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I just want to throw that out there because, you know, it's, it's really important because people can, and, and I think in this context too, why, um, Man, I just know it's tough because it, it's one of those things where I, it's sad because I could see how this could be a problem and I could see people being upset with me over it. But, oh, well, you know, like, I do think it's important to have a spiritual father. I really do. And mm -hmm. I know that there's people who they come from certain small T traditions and they, they say that that's not necessary. And they say, like, oh, that's just guruism. Oh, that's just you trying to emulate, you know, 18th century Russia, blah, blah, blah. But I'm like, I don't you know, know. You're, you're really depriving yourself of something there. I am. Not, I maybe, I mean, maybe it's not absolutely necessary, like because, I mean, St. Mary of Egypt was in the desert and everything. But it's like, are you really going to go be St. Mary of Egypt? And so here's you know the thing. I mean? right? <laughs> and great point. Right. Because there's St. Mary of Egypt. Right. St. Silouan, the Athenite, didn't have, you know, like a direct spiritual father like that, you know. St. Paisios at times, you know. He, but see, the thing is, all three of them, you know, number one, submitted themselves to some degree. And on top of that, the level of in perseverance that they had in, in, in very difficult situations. Um, and not, not vainglorious situations of like, look at me. Nobody was looking at St. Mary of Egypt. There was nobody for her to be like, do you see how much I'm suffering, right? St. Silouan, for the most part, went unnoticed except for those people who had discernment, who knew what was going on with them, you know? Like, 
that's very, very different. And it's, it's, it is generally, you know, kind of rare. And the reason why I'm saying this is because in the age that we're living in now, where, you know, it's great technology is being used um, in, a, in a beneficial way. Orthodoxy is being spread. Well, what that also means is that people are reading and learning and hearing about experiences and doing this. And I'm just saying, like, I've seen it where people do go off the rails. Yeah. And so that that's why I'm, I'm saying I, I think having a spiritual war is important because it isn't even just in this kind of like, woo, you know, like, because most people, 99% of people, your spiritual father is not going to be some holy Athenite elder who, you know what I mean? And if you're looking for that, you know, that's part of the problem. Like, sure. just, just take the good direction from your parish priest. You know what I mean? Take the good direction from, from the deacon at your parish. Take the good direction from your godfather. You know what I mean? Like, you don't need to have... Well, there's the one, elegance. There's that's, the that's that's the elegance is that you it's like I mean? no you don't he's not making you go to athos right he's giving it to you right here well that's right. too simple and it's like right. no <laughs> right and that's the no, thing is, he's gonna give it to you right now and that's the thing is every most the vast majority of people you have everything you already need in front of you yeah. right the vast majority of people now all that being said it's just i just want to kind of close the loop on that that simple accountability, that's why I'm saying I think, you know, it, it's really important for people to have a spiritual father because not because of some woo-woo thing and you need to find someone who's going to teach you hesychasm. It's because simple accountability is, I mean, that's, that's just a part of community. That's a part of yeah. a family, yeah. right? And, it's, and it's, it's absolutely necessary when you're talking about the life in Christ, because there is no lower ranger Christian. There is no, you know, on an island. And it's like, even the, even the, the ascetical hermits, they don't go away to run away from people, right? They, they go away first and foremost to be with Christ uninterrupted and secondarily, you know, for the love of the world. And if you're paying attention to anything I've been saying the last whatever, you know, year, you'll realize you really don't want Christ the way you think you do. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, because that's the thing about the ascetic, the ascetical hermits is they've gotten, they've gotten past that point where, you know, they're not flipping out when God chastises them and corrects them. They, they they want Christ, right? We have to have the humility to realize we have a long ways to go because God still needs to chastise us and we need to thank God for that chastisement. You know sure. what I mean? But it's not fun. It's not, it's not pleasurable, but it's, it's necessary. You know what I mean? And I, I bet, I don't know this for sure, but I would bet for every hermit who made it all by themselves, oh. probably five to 10 who absolutely fell into probably spiritual more. delusion. Uh, way more than five to 10. I'm probably speaking more. pretty conservatively. Yeah, you're being conservative for sure. But there are stories of monks on Athos jumping off of cliffs because mm -hmm. demons deceived into the point where they were told them they could fly. They could fly, right. Yeah, and so they jumped off thinking that they were going to be able to fly and they ended up dying, or, you know. I think... And, and those are, I mean, those it's are right in the based. icon of the Ladder of Divine Ascent, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, that's, those, that's a playing out of that exact icon. And those are extreme cases. And it, it's, it, it's in that same ratio. For, for every one of those extreme cases, cases, there's so many of just people falling into these really seemingly small mundane things, but they, they There's begin stuff. to twist people. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. I, 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 I can't, I kind of come back to this um, metaphor a couple of times, like, in my life it's like there's the path and there's these off ramps and those those off ramps are dead ends and people love hanging out those dead ends so i think i brought it up with when we were talking about pride month last time that there's this whole dead end of of um self-pity or whatever i think another there's this like dead end where people just get stuck on this one thing and they just like cannot let it go whether it's like political or whether it's some doctrinal issue or whether like What's that? 
aliens alien <laughs> yeah yeah well and yeah like i've become obsessed with like i guess the spectacle and like we'll sit and listen to the lord of spirits about like uh and that's a fine podcast i'm not besmirching it at all but we'll listen to the nephilim, the nephilim. Uh, yeah and like all that cool stuff and but then like when it comes to like the day-to-day operations of being like say a father or a husband or mm. just an orthodox christian there's this whole like they just can't get it down and again speaking from experience and even saint paisios found that little boy that like little boy that was yeah. like what are we going to do today it, like he didn't have an abbot at that time or someone to be that's uh, right obedient to so he went and found the little boy and um like a little 10 year old boy he's like well what are we going to do today and he's like well i have to chop wood and then go tend to my sheep and he's like let's do that and just yeah. like followed him around and i that is something that i i mean yeah it's obedience is wonderful like i can say that like it's a virtue that i would love to see fostered and more people if you could just say like hey just be obedient because again we're not approaching a force we're approaching a person and the person respects and and blesses you know people who are obedient even if it's kind of some whack stuff that they're obedient to as long as it's not heretical and and that force is always right <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know yeah. that person right that person is is excuse me that person is is always right you know and, because and, the and off that, ramps, an off ramp can't make it necessarily de facto. An off ramp can't become tradition. I would think an off ramp. No. Well, no, it can't because yeah. you're off. Because you because you're gone. You're off. Yeah. Right. So anything that's anything that has remained as tradition, which is why it just like it's so. Again, it's so simple because yeah. somebody would would ask like. And this this came up in this conversation, right? I think we were talking about Mount Athos and and women not being allowed on Mount Athos, on Mount Athos. And it was like the, you know, the secular Jewish midwife who was obviously, you know, kind of wokey le- leftish a little bit, you know, that like, Oh, well, why, why couldn't women go on to Mount Athos? And I, I had recalled reading that there's no like legislation that says that women can, but, and I was like, I told her, you know, you probably could go. Like if you walked onto Mount Athos and you encountered a, a monk, You'd probably have an interesting conversation, but they would probably be like, why do you feel like you need to be here? Yeah. Like, what is this? What What's going on with you that you feel like you need to be here? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's and and so it's like, well, why? Why would you do that? Well, because it's tradition. Well, what would happen if you didn't do it? And it's like, well, the answer to that has already been answered, but it's probably been answered so long ago that we've forgotten the exact thing of what the answer is, but it wouldn't have made it into interd- to tradition without it having been answered haven't haven't there also been women who have been disguised as men and gone to athos yeah and there's times when like um there's jewish refugees during the nazi um um persecution that there's there's been there's monks that hid some women some jewish women and children interestingly enough jewish um mm-hmm. to to save them so i mean you know, again, I guess getting to getting back to the point in regards of what tradition means and how, you know, tradition is the experience of the Holy Spirit. Tra- tradition, that's what tradition is. Tradition is the experience of the, the life of the Holy Spirit um, lived by the church, you know, in the Holy Spirit. And so tradition, capital T, you know, it's like a map. It's like, this is how you get from point A to point B, right? And, it, and the map is works because it's true. And, and I think this is one of the problems with some of these things is that, you know, I understand where, interestingly enough, because of different off-ramps. So it's like, yeah, okay, you do get these abuses that happen, you know, where um, guruism or people, like you're always going to have, like in regards to the spiritual father example, right? You're always going to have individuals who are just. Hey, oh, oh, you're we muted. Lost your, we lost your audio. Did you mute yeah, yourself? Yeah. Or is it, or is it your mic? Did you lose your mic? Nice mic. Hold it out. Well, I gave you my insight into this. 
This is what I've got. I'm just going to vamp for father real quick. Oh, while he, please. he fixes his audio thing. I don't have any real insight. Tradition is everything. I mean, like I, I like, I cannot as an American, I'm like, why did we give up tradition? Like, what did we gain by like, like giving up this whole, like, and we, we gave up some demons, wax. demons in the enemy. That's why. So, and so that's really interesting because Cyprian, you're a DC guy, right? You were from yeah. Washington, DC for a little yeah. while, right? Born, okay. born and went to college there. Yeah. Did you ever go to the tomb of the unknown soldier? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I watched walking a, in front. Yeah. So I watched a thing about that guard tonight. Okay. And like, and I, I was watching because like, apparently it's a very selective process to get that guard. Um, and they have to uphold a number of rituals. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it just like occurred to me. I was like, whose rituals are these? Like, cause they don't seem godly and maybe the they state are state religion. Sure. Yes. It's the religion okay. of the state. It's the state religion. But if you keep walking that back, where do we end up? You know what I mean? Like where do, where do, where does like that very specific militaristic, like American feel come from, you know what Powers I mean? Powers and principalities. I mean, it's not like they're have. I mean, Athena was a virgin warrior. She's a warrior God. Right. So it's like, you look at the tomb of the unknown soldier and you feel like you're it's it's probably an old Roman tradition, to be honest with you. A lot of the like the US state religion but, things are Roman in nature. But it's like probably the, a Roman pagan tradition. Okay. Okay, that makes yeah, it's yeah, probably Roman pagan. It felt very like inhuman, like their movements, like the way they're like their feet slide and like slap mm -hmm. together and stuff like that. It felt very inhuman and like even the way that they walk. Like mm -hmm. the way that they held guns and stuff and like looked at him and stuff, it all felt very inhuman. Like, and I think that that's ultimately why I think again, God wins because it's just like when you approach orthodoxy, it's just like this whole, like, it's so to the soul. And like, I sent father a sermon today, um, by the, or a homily today by a guy, a priest. And I wanted to say this earlier, now, father, please put a pen in your thought that you had before your Wait, mic. Is your mic working now? By the way, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Good. Um, you might so, need to scoot it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like, uh, th there's a saint. There's basically the, <laughs> the name of the <laughs> video was Pride Month is demonic. I was like, okay, well, okay. you got me, you know. And like, right. um, and he basically he was not incredibly eloquent. Like he was not very like. I don't know if you watched that, Father. Mm. I know like, him. Oh, you know him. Oh, you know him. Mm -hmm. So. I thought he was great. He's a good. I, he's. I can. I can say he's a. He's a good friend of mine. Okay, so he was not particularly eloquent, and even at one point, the homie said, "I didn't know I was going to be talking about this today," mm -hmm. and that is not how I've approached. I've heard homilies approach. It seems like the priest always. It never seems off the cuff. It seems like they've given some thought to what this is going to be beforehand, and it was very like non-structured, and he just kind of ranted for a little bit. But the message was so powerful that even though it was delivered in a way that like maybe was not the most articulate, and I don't even mean that offensively, but it was not delivered the most articulately, like the message being more powerful than the man, like mm -hmm. the, the spirit being more powerful than the man hit me in a way that's like the, even the most eloquent orator, or whatever, who's espousing not yeah, true. I mean, honestly, just to back you up, that's scripture. That's St. Paul. Yeah, it did not I mean, come to you with elegance of eloquence of speech. That's Saint Paul, and that that's actually that is in some regards, depending on the the school of thought that you come from, in regards of homiletics, that that's an actual thing. In in regards of, um, you know, what are you striving for when you're giving a homily? When you're, and and I will just tell you, like, not every look. You know, it's not like priests get some kind of like, you know, suitcase where they get like this toolkit. It's like, you know, um, some priests can give good homilies. Some can't, you know, mm. some are great liturgists. Some aren't. Some are great pastors. Some aren't. Some are spiritual fathers. You know, some aren't. But the thing that is consistent and, and should be the consistent thread is is understanding um that the content is always the main thing because the content is Christ and, mm. and what, what Christ, what, excuse me, forgive me. I do want to walk that back. 
um, what God wants. I, I'm, I'm walking that back a little bit because the Holy Spirit, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, how the Holy Spirit, um, not only what the Holy Spirit wants to say, but how the Holy Spirit wants to say it is, is, uh, is a, a real important and should be an important aspect of what, what's going in um, to a homily or, or a, a speech or whatever, you know, but what, what I always love and this is what this is the point I'm going to make and then I'm done. And then we can go back to what father was saying pre audio snafu um, is that uh, towards the end of his homily, you heard a kid freaking out mm -hmm. like, and like had to be taken out of service. And like you hear that in Father Sarah from Rose's talk on the apocalypse. You hear that in almost every single metropolitan neophytus of Morphu, like every good like Orthodox. Teacher. Oh, yeah. I was meaning to ask about this. I was meaning to ask about this pattern because I know I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I got that's it. okay. Go, go, so finish, finish. No, finish, you hear a kid crying. Because it's about this. Yes. You hear a kid crying and I'm instantly like, it's orthodox. Like you hear that and you're mm -hmm. like, it's orthodox because a, a child is freaking out. And like, to me, that is a big <laughs> part of my church experience is a kid freaking out. And it's like, nobody's like, shut, 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 shut. Like, shut. No, it's like, it's human. It's life. Like the kid's going to freak out. The mom, most likely the mom is going to miss some of the homily. Like, that's it. Like, she has to go out with the child who's upset. For me, that is a quint, like, that is, that is part of orthodoxy is a kid freaking out having to be dragged out of church. And for me, like, that between that and like at the tomb of the unknown soldier, mm -hmm. a person talks and the unknown soldier will stop the ritual and look at that person and say, Oh, so an order of silence must be maintained at all times. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's so inhuman. And I'm sure that there's that in the church as well. But like at the same time, it's never delivered under that spirit. I just, it was, I was just a vamping thought while father was fixing his audio. And now it is concluded. That uh, I was, I was actually, father, this was something I had wa wanted to uh, ask you about for a while because I feel like there was some episode a ways back when you brought, brought this up. But like, well, you know, when we're doing typica or what at, at that at here in our home and everything, mm -hmm. usually my kids are like totally fine. Mm -hmm. But the one part where if something's going to happen, it's going to be when the gospel comes out, mm -hmm. like every single time. And I remembered you you saying something about um, children crying during the gospel, and that's like parents going. Is that like a thing? Is that a thing that like or or is or is this just random? Is this just a a pattern that I'm seeing that's not that's not doesn't really exist? But I mean, anything could happen, right? But it'll always be something that will like affect my kids, where like where there will be a distraction, mm -hmm. and it's always at that point. It's never another point. So there's that that Every is a thing. <laughs> um, that is a thing, but especially it's a thing in your context, especially because in doing typica, right? Um, because so there's a hierarchy of um, of kind of sacramental experience, right? And so for you doing typica, that is sacramental, you know, kind of like your high point, right? Because the gospel is Christ being presented. Do you see what I'm saying? But in a context where you know it's a liturgy, right? And there's there's a an anaphora, you know that paclesis you know it's like it, it raises up a little bit right and so depending on what's happening you'll you know you can find these patterns of um depends how you want to look at it disturbance you can maybe look at it as you know kind of injection of life you know however you want to have you want to phrase it you know like um i'll give you an example um you know, I'll, I'll, I'll bet $5, you know, at any time I, anytime I do a baptism, I've done a baptism, especially like with kids, you know, it's like, okay, someone who can just say, well, of course, kids are going to freak out because there's water, blah, blah, blah. But I'm like, mm, you watch kids and, and watching kids in regards of a baptism, not just the ones who are getting baptized, but also ones who are present in there. It, it's pretty fascinating, actually. Um you know, there's this whole thing of the eyes of the body see, you know, see a pool, see a bath, but the eyes of the soul see a grave. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's there's a reality um, that, and, you know, 
it's all good, right? And I don't just mean that in the colloquialism, but literally it's all good because it is life, like Andrew said, you know. Um, but there's just, a, there's a reality in which um, there's unseen things that are happening that oftentimes affect people and kids, it's imperceptible to them, right? It's imperceptible. Um, and, you know, the, the reality of... Um, you know, people may be having some stowaways, <laughs> yeah. some, st some stowaways with yeah. them. Um, that's, you know, that that's a thing, too. That, that's a thing, too. Um, I know that little Matrona, my little 11 month old, there's been so many times in liturgy where she'll look up at the air and just go hi like that. And she'll just like wave. And I'm like, OK, all right. You keep that. You keep that as yeah. best as you can, you know, because like. Yeah, there's I heard somewhere something like if a baby looks beyond you, you know, not superstitiously. So, you know, with discernment, if a baby looks beyond you and smiles, that's your guardian angel. Like, you know, looking looking down at the baby or whatever, and the baby gets all happy and stuff like that. That's the guardian angel kind of like probably making kissy faces at the baby or whatever. So um but uh father, do you remember what you were saying before the audio the the tradition is how we experience the holy spirit that's the last part i remember yeah i guess that's it <laughs> i don't remember what else there was so that's yeah. but that um yeah um actually oh, oh i think i was gonna say um and if i wasn't gonna say it that's i think it's still worth saying um and, and that's also why um you know you don't need to have like that special spiritual father you know what i mean because mm. um you know, kind of in line of like what you're speaking about with the uh, homily with Father Seraphim, um, um, not Rose, but Holland, the the pride. Homily. Okay. Um, it, it where there's faith in when there's faith in the Holy Trinity, then there's security and trust and, and freedom, and and then you aren't free if you feel um, some vain need to have you know the perfect spiritual father you know what i mean um that that you know you're in bondage to some degree at that point yeah um there's there's a real freedom in realizing like you know all of this is a means to you holy trinity and so you know um i trust you to be able to speak even through a donkey you know <laughs> um and and to me that is real freedom and to me that is one of the many ways that the power of the Holy Trinity is, is evidenced in our lives and why, um, you know, it says, even if it's possible, the elect would be deceived, but, you know, this is the thing for the elect, the, the, the elect truly know, know who they're looking for. And it's like Father Seraphim Rose says, you know, St. Seraphim Rose, he says, you know, those who are, um, I'm paraphrasing, but those who are enamored with, vestments and, and and sensors these are going to be the first to fall for antichrist um and it's because they're in bondage to these things you know the outside of the cup it's the, it's not the outside of the cup that that's a bondage um freedom comes from you know knowing the power of the holy trinity knowing the power that christ brings to us and the liberty that he proclaims to the captives and that liberty is one that's experienced essentially in the heart. And when you experience that, then you're able to really encounter Christ everywhere. And that's why, you know, even with like a prayer rule, you know, um, and, you know, don't anybody get any crazy deluded ideas. Cause if you think that you can drop your prayer rule, cause you have prayer, like you're, <laughs> you're deluded. Um, but there is this place where you, you know, entering into prayer all the time, you know what I mean? But it's, it's the path of getting there is just as important. You know what I mean? And I think that's one of the things about tradition. Tradition is holistic and it never pits one against the other. You know, our tradition and holy tradition is both. And, you know, holy tradition is the, the faithfulness to keeping the prayer rule, but not needing to, does that make sense? You know, the faithfulness sure. to keeping it, but the not needing to, it's the, um, 
what is what is that phrase? Um, um, you know, it, it's kind of like the uh, not yet and you know, not yet, but there, like it's, it's this kind of in between always. So that paradox, essentially, you know, it's like Dr. Man, Dr. Manhattan with the able to see the past and the present and the future. And they're mm -hmm. all one. Thing I wanted to bring that one. up earlier, yeah. but when we were talking about it, when we were talking about the watchman, and I'm sorry, but you said Dr. Manhattan and like, I'm not supposed mm -hmm. to say something after that, but yep. um, I was actually talking about how someone was talking to me who was a comic book fan and they're not orthodox and they said well doesn't god knowing everything that's going to happen his knowledge of everything that's going to happen doesn't that take away free will i'm like not even at all like no like dr manhattan is not a one for one but he interacts with the world knowing fully at all times of what's going to happen but he still interacts with it now he claims that he's a puppet he just sees the strings that's not that's not the case here like i'm like it's like if i set a glass of water down i know my daughter zenya is going to drink it she just does that's just a thing that she's going through right now anytime anybody sets a glass of water down in the house it's free game for her apparently so she'll run up and drink it every single time that doesn't negate her free will i just know what's going to happen mm -hmm. and so like dr manhattan interacting with the world even crying at a certain point in the story because he got his feelings hurt, even though he already knew it was going to happen. But him still interacting with the world in that way is like, in no way negates his free will. He still has his free will. He just knows exactly what this path looks like. So unless I'm wrong, which I probably am, it's not a one for one. But I think it is an interesting way of like approaching that whole like, um, uh, of needing to like experience, but at the same time, like having an understanding of like, the path that's going to take you there like i don't know i mean well, free will know. doesn't it doesn't negate the fact that there's an order to things and so like you're going to take you're going to do this but it's like if you break tradition like it's not you don't have the you don't have the free will to change reality like no. you, free will doesn't change truth so it's like you're gonna you, yeah you have the choice of what to interact with but there there's going to be a path there's yeah. going to be something there's going to be a consequence to what you're going to do Mm. Do you have anything, any anything to add, Father? Because I'm, I'm a. You know, it's 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 interesting because um, the presupposition is that time is linear is part of the problem, and um, I, I think it's just tough for us because. It's kind of the theme earlier in the conversation about there's things, the way we experience things, we experience them because of our limitations. You know what I mean? And um, they're not bad. I mean, it just it is what it is. We're we're we are not uncreated. We're created. Um, and so because of that, the the boundaries by which we experience life, um, it's just what we have. And we get little touches that tell us otherwise, right? Like we've talked about this at times, you know, some little ways that you can get a little kiss, a little breeze of eternity, right? And when you when you get that little touch, it's like you, that's why I can say that. It's like, yeah, time isn't linear. I'm not just saying that as like, oh, like, you know, that's a philosophy. It's like, no, no, no. It's once you've had an experience once you've had these little moments of just the kiss of eternity, you realize time isn't linear as we understand it. Right. And so because of that, you know, when we, that's a part of theosis too, is, um, you know, as, as we grow in union with Christ and, and with those who love Christ, the saints, um, first and foremost, we have their experience and their testimony of things. But their experience of testimony becomes tradition and a map for us by which we can begin to test and discern some of the life that we are, are given to live. And, and I think this is all important because this, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is this is some of the stuff that makes the difference between um, what you're living for, who you're living for, you know, because 
it's really easy. This is one of the big problems with, with like the moralism thing and just looking at orthodoxy as like the right camp ideologically is that it, let's just go ahead and say it is the right camp ideologically. I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Um, because I don't want to ever give the impression, which I think, I think some people might think that where I'm some sort of like moral relativist. I'm not, you know what I mean? That's, that's not what this is about. But it's, it's the right that, camp because it's truth. It, exactly. And, yeah. and it's because it's truth. And it's also, there's more, right? There's, there's more. It, it's kind of like, um, it's like, you know, I look at my kids, you know, I got one kid, I have two kids who live on their own and I got, uh, what is that? Seven more, six more. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> uh, you lose who, for a while. Yeah. You know what I mean? To, to varying degrees, understand life outside of the boundaries of, of the home. Right. And when I say the boundaries of the home, what am I talking about? Am I talking about, you know, the, the, the house that was built? No. Right. Like, yes, I am talking about that, but clearly that's not all I'm talking about because even my two year old knows what life is like beyond that. Because my two-year-old goes to church. We just came back from the Ozarks. Like my two-year-old knows that there's more outside of the fence of our home, right? But when I mean home, I mean the confines of his life existence, his mother, his father, his brothers, his sisters. You see what I'm saying? His like church family. Like that's home. That's that is the true sense of home, right? But this is this is the thing is there's there's even more beyond that. Right. And, and this gets back to St. Paisius about, you know, a spiritual man is one who has room in his heart for everyone, for 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 a lot of people. And to be able to ex to enlarge your heart, as the father say, and and have this glimpse of the impossible, which is. Man. To actually have love for your enemies. That's that's a taste of something that is beyond the limitations of what society has told us. That's what I mean by like those little kisses of eternity. Once you've actually had real enemies and you've actually exercised and felt genuine love for them, you know what I'm talking about. If you've never had it, then you're probably scratching your head. But if you know what I'm talking about, those are those moments where you go like, this is all real. This whole thing is real. The saints, the Holy Trinity, heaven, eternal life. It's all real. And that step is what makes you want to take the next step to have that next experience that will be ratified by the tradition of the church. Right. And over time you look back and you're like, I'm actually a Christian now. You know what I mean? I actually, you know, I'm not like kind of crossing my fingers while I'm doing this thing. You know, it's like, no, it's like St. Nikolai says, I don't believe I know. Right. And that's what we all want to get to. That's where you want to get to. But in order to do that, you have to live in, you have to live within tradition and you have to live within tradition in such a way that your experiences, this is that, that hypostatic principle I've talked about, that your experiences, you know, become integrated into the body of Christ, like mystically, literally, like, because that is the human experience because Christ is, you know, the man, <laughs> literally, yeah. you know, sure. and that's, that's, that's what I mean by going beyond and, and having these experiences. And that's why it's like, um, I was just reflecting on, you know, I, I have this, every, I have this all the time, right. I, I live in this, right. But there's moments where it becomes spectacular, you know, like that Montanica conference, it was like, you know, how is it that I'm home? I've never been to this place. Some of these people I've I've never. Some of the people I, I've I've only encountered online, like DPH, you know, um, and finally getting to meet him in person. But some of these people I've never even like talked to before. But like, how is it that I'm home? How is it that I'm? You know what I mean? That that's a thing, and not just in some sort of poetic. Oh, that's quaint. I mean, you know, in a very real sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. Objectively true. Objectively, objectively true. Ob like undeniably objectively mm -hmm. true. 
And that's yeah. possible because Christ is real and Christ right. is true and we share in his life. Right. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. Yeah. Uh yeah, I can I can say that as soon as I I mean, I've been to a fair amount of churches across America the minute I walk in and smell the incense see an icon i'm like okay i'm in a safe place it's like mm -hmm. a it's like an oasis in the mm -hmm. desert it's like okay cool i'm here and like even if this priest is whack even if the congregation's whack whatever you know like it's okay because christ is here like christ mm -hmm. is like here and he knows why i'm here so like um for better or for worse. forgive me i just want to kind of jump on because i just want to kind of like beat this to death um you know, whack priest, whack congregation, how do you get past that? Well, um, this is one of the many dangers of where society is headed in regards to people don't want families. They don't, you know what I mean? Because if you come from a family, then you understand what I'm about to say real easy. It's like, yeah, I mean, anytime at any point of the day of the month of the year, my kids can go like, my family's whack. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? You, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, what does that really mean for them? And, and I think taking that literally, any parent can say that about his kids, any sibling can say that about their their siblings or their parents, but but what but it's still home. Yep. It's still home. Yeah. They are home, right? When you're with them, you're mm -hmm. home, you know. So that's yeah. why that's why it's really important, you know. Um getting away from some of this stuff in regards of, you know, just thinking that you need something more than what's in front of you. And sometimes you do, right? I mean, sometimes you do. And if you do, then that's what God has for you. And you're on a journey, you know, and because that's part of the life in Christ too, you know, like having to leave Nazareth, having to leave Bethlehem, you know, Abraham had to leave Ur, like that's part of it too. Don't get me wrong. I get that. But generally speaking, um, you know, the real adventure is navigating the waters and the space that's in front of you. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, there's not, it's, it's like, um, it's tedious and unromantic and that's, that's good. I mean, it's a good thing. That means you're not looking for the same thing I was looking for when I was into hallucinogens and stuff. I'm not looking for these grand experiences. It's mm -hmm. oftentimes it's the very small, it's the very, like you can almost miss it. And it's like allowing people back into your heart, even though you've been hurt, you know, even though like you may they, have, they, they seem small, but again, with your minimalist example, right. It's that it's so, like, it's how so many times profound. can it be this subtle shift that makes all the difference it's in like, the world? Yeah. And it's like orthodoxy has been very much like a return to life. You know, like it's very much like a return to like, you don't get to be born again. Right. It's yeah, you know, hey, that's like a really good way of putting it, Father. Uh I'd like uh somebody it, write that down. Somebody write that yeah. <laughs> All right, we're gonna stop there. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna stop there. Um yeah, we're coming up on two hours, I think, approximately, somewhere around there. Probably not exactly, but what are you gonna do? Shout out to focus on that question. We'll get to that question. Yeah, we'll hey, focus. focus. We're gonna do that next week. It, God God willing. And you know, I do wanna say I think I'd be remiss if I didn't at least mention the somewhat inconsistent release schedule recently. Um, we've been skipping weeks and stuff like that, and it's just gonna happen. I just felt like I'd say something. It's not like none of us are not committed to the project anymore. Like I still definitely am um it's, i feel like it's, people understand our release schedule sure i feel like they understand like yeah it'll be it, yeah it'll be here when you need it you know yeah I mean? like, that's <laughs> true that's true that's but i still wanted to say like hey it's not like uh you know if we miss a week you know it's it's probably for a very good reason so mm -hmm. um so okay how do i okay so there is the contact information if you want to reach out with a question it's contact at royalpath.network a couple of people have still been reaching out to me directly at andrew at royalpath.network that's totally fine you can keep doing that just know the reason why i stopped doing that as the main contact is i'm really bad about getting back to people i i it's not a mark against you or anything like that i just it just slips my mind and it continues to just slip my mind and slip my mind i'm not good at correspondence um 
Uh, then also we have a playlist on Spotify. It's not been updated in quite a while. But if we mention someone, like a musical artist, generally we try and throw it on there. It's Royal Path Podcast Playlist on Spotify, I think. Um, there's also a merch store, royalpath.store. Any proceeds go to either the parish and then one third goes to the people who make the merch. None of us see any of that stuff. And we are going to probably have to have a meeting with that merch person sometime soon about, mm-hmm. but I think Atlantis will rise again. And I'm yeah, orthodox. I'm orthodox. I do, I do ancient, ancient things. things. Yeah. yeah. Like I think those are both like absolutely should be merch. Yeah. Um, other than that, I think that's it. Uh, thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>